Well, we do have a quorum now, so I'll open the meeting. And to remind everybody, it is a fully remote meeting. That means when you speak, you need to say your name. And, and if you're uh, on the board, just repeat that, that you're on the board and or where you live. And that uh, we are going to try to stay focused on topic and keep the conversation focused and ask everybody to keep mindful of the time, two, three minutes, uh, particularly in the public comment time. But when we're talking about topics, try not to repeat ourselves. So we can be done on time, if not early. So uh, the meeting is opened and I'd like to have approval of the agenda. Are there any additions to it? If not, by unanimous consent, we'll accept the agenda and move forward. Any public comment? Okay. Oh, good. Kim, I see Kim coming on board. Great. And Brian, Chief Pete. So we're now going to go on to the minutes of the May 12th meeting. Any additions, corrections to the draft presented? Entertain a motion to accept the minutes. Doug is making a motion. I saw a motion there. <laughs> yes. As soon as I find the right button, yes, move for proof. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Good, Mel can hit the right button. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. We're proving that the, the minutes. Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Uh, Kim, I see you talking, but I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Yeah, your screen says you're muted, Kim. Ah, oh, there it is. There we go. Um, I'm abstaining. I wasn't at the meeting. Okay, you're 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 green. All right. Motions passed. Any any opposed? Motions passed as presented. Thank you, Justin. Next is uh, Televate's report on their RFP, and Dom is here, and so is Rick. Proceed, gentlemen. Okay, uh, I'll uh, uh, go ahead if I may. I do have. Uh, you want me to share the screen with you? Yes, I would like to share a screen. I believe you have to enable that. Yes. <laughs> well, it says you started screen sharing. No, no. Oh. Yeah, you did. Okay. Okay. I the right button came up. I think I hit it. Try it again. Yes, um, I've got uh, approval to share. So here we go. Uh, hopefully, you can see a PowerPoint. Yeah, we also can see your screen. Perhaps you can. You can also see what, sorry. The whole screen, could you turn it into a slideshow so we just see the slide itself? How's that? It's slideshow on my end. Um, okay, no. uh, right under the, right above the design, it's the top, it'll go in the mode. We don't see it yet, it's coming though, it looks like. So you're seeing something different than what I'm seeing, I guess. Uh, let me. Uh... We're seeing the sidebar. We're oh, not in. Okay. No, that's not We're good. In presentation mode. Actually, it looks like it's frozen because there's a. Yeah, the middle's got that dot going, doesn't it? Okay. Um, yeah, I was getting my extended display, so I'm changing. Now. What do you got now? <laughs> yeah, we're seeing we're seeing what the presenter normally sees. We're not seeing the yeah. There you go. Got Beautiful. It. 
Okay. All right. Well, I don't see it, but that's okay. All right. Uh, I, I can see my, my presenter screen. Okay. Uh, so I've just got a brief overview of where we stand with the RFP. I'll uh, take you through that and encourage you to ask questions along the way uh, whenever you have them. So a very high level, uh, go through our development process. Uh, so, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, developed a system concept that we described in our report from last year. Uh, so we had a meeting with the uh, uh, Twin Cities team to confirm that system concept and to develop it to further detail. Uh, that included developing coverage requirements as well as confirming uh, the radio sites to be used. And we did uh, evaluate a few additional sites uh, throughout that process to see if uh, they might be beneficial for the design. We're, we're uh, uh, pretty much uh, finalizing on the sites we had discussed in, in the report. Uh, but we did evaluate a few others. Uh, one of the big items that we're uh, trying to detail is the site interconnectivity. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, uh, a number of sites, about, I think there's 12 in total throughout the network. And we must be able to uh, communicate, of course, with each of those, especially in a simulcast uh, design. It's very important to have. Uh, specific uh, timing to each site and be able to uh, communicate directly with the site. So we'll have a, we'll show a little bit more in detail there. We'll have a variety uh, actually of different ways of connecting to the sites in the most efficient manner. Uh, and then the sites will need to be uh, developed. Uh, we can, uh, you know, there are various ways to do that. Uh, we believe it's most efficient for the Twin Cities to take on some of the uh, responsibilities there. Uh, we don't really want to have the vendor do everything. Uh, that would be uh, uh, probably cost prohibitive in this case and uh, would probably lengthen the schedule as well. So, uh, so we're uh, recommending certain actions be done by the Twin Cities and uh, a few for the vendor to handle. So moving on, uh, system design. Uh, this is what was described in the report. And uh, uh, this is what we are describing in our RFP, that we would want uh, interested vendors to quote implementation of this type of design. Uh, it's a dual uh, simulcast cell, if you will, uh, two different simulcast cells, uh, one uh, within the uh, city areas covering city of Montpelier and Berry City, and also a, a corridor that runs kind of between the two. And then we have a broader system that covers all of the uh, towns uh, supported by uh, either the cities or uh, Capital Fire. Uh, we uh, will have a separate frequency pair uh, for each of these systems to allow for uh, uh, separate communications. Uh, so uh, to reduce congestion uh, between the two networks. So the different uh, or different portions of the network will have different frequency pairs. And uh, we have uh, identified specific uh, interference-free frequencies that uh, have uh, been licensed in many of the sites and we'll need, to, uh, we'll need to finish the licensing of those. We will be calling for support of what uh, many people refer to as a mixed mode system. It will support both analog voice and digital P25 capability. And uh, uh, digital P25 is uh, important as it's the digital standard being implemented by public safety uh, throughout the US and many uh, other countries as well. And uh, it's uh, uh, generally key to support that uh, when uh, pursuing uh, you know, outside funding or pursuing grants. Uh, the system, although it'll have two separate uh, simulcast cells, will have a common uh, switching center or common core uh, to uh, 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 ensure that uh, there's connectivity uh, throughout both of the cells and both dispatch centers and also as a most efficient design. I'll pause here for a second, see if there's any questions. Uh, okay. I got one, Don, but I think you may have answered it. <clears throat> Yes, go ahead, Doug. The uh, 
the separate frequencies can either location, either dispatch center operate one or the other. Yes. I think you just said that. I yes, uh, they'll be able to operate uh, either frequency for either network. Uh, that's both uh, for reasons of, uh, um, you know, depending on what uh, uh, jurisdiction needs to be uh, supported uh, by which uh, dispatch center and also to uh, support for uh, uh, redundancy. Uh, for instance, uh, if for some reason, uh, uh, Barry City had to uh, evacuate their dispatch center for one reason or another, uh, all um, the, the system could still be supported uh, uh, from the Montpelier dispatch location. So no, uh, uh, no functionality would be lost there and vice versa. Uh, that's the intent. Thank you. Okay, we are uh, defining the coverage areas and uh, um, I do have a graphic of uh, uh, the predicted coverage after this, uh, but uh, what we're uh, uh, identifying here, uh, this is uh, just in text, but we will have a graphic also to show for the what we call the city system. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have the city of Barrie and city of Montpelier, and we're recommending a corridor between the two uh, that runs along Route 302. So we would suggest a mile either side of that uh, uh, connecting. So we would uh, ask for uh, coverage within that area. And we're, ask, we're gonna ask the vendors to respond to give us a coverage commitment uh, within that area. So they will perform their design uh, as part of their response to the RFP. And we'll ask them to indicate uh, the uh, coverage percentage uh, at a certain level of voice quality they can provide from a mobile radio operating within that area, also from a portable radio operating within that area, and then we identify two levels of in-building coverage. Uh, one, what we refer to as suburban coverage. So, so uh, um, coverage within a light uh, type of building, light to medium building. And then urban coverage would be a more uh, robust in-building coverage to provide coverage within a more substantial uh, medium buildings. So two levels there for the in-building coverage. Uh, so in each of these cases, so this is a table that the vendor will fill out, uh, the vendor will tell us what their commitment is in each of these. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhere 95% uh, uh, for, for certain levels, uh, maybe a little less in the urban building coverage, but they'll provide a, a coverage guarantee, and then we will test to that once the uh, system is installed and they will uh, be required per contract to meet that commitment or else uh, fix the system such that it does. So that covers the city area. We're doing a similar thing in the town area. Uh, and we list all of the towns here that are included that uh, are supported by Capital Fire. We have the uh, uh, addition here of uh, Chelsea. Uh, I think this needs to be, uh, I'm just looking at this, sorry. Uh, needs to be updated as uh, Chelsea has been added in here as tentative. Uh, so we will update that. And similarly, we'll ask for mobile coverage, portable coverage. And uh, for the broader system, uh, throughout the towns, we're going to ask for suburban level coverage uh, for that type of system. So if I, if I could add to that. Uh, yeah, basically, please. how that's achieved is based on signal strength. So the commitment yeah. is going to be that that they will deliver a certain signal level um, to ensure that there is sufficient signal level to penetrate particular types of buildings. So every building has a unique personality, of course, and and the amount of signal loss or attenuation that it experiences is all relative to that building. I mean, you know, we, we already know that we have some pretty challenging buildings to get radio signals into. So um, 
you know, we we're, I'm not real optimistic that they're going to get cover everything, but but this this approach allows them to um, provide us a design um, and a guarantee to that design of how much signal level they will deliver outside of the building, um, and and basically that that is how you determine um, you know the the level of in building signal that they're going to get. Thanks, Rick. All right, and and of course, uh, you know, we expect multiple bids from uh, uh, different vendors. So this will be a key area that we compare uh, between the two vendors as to what they can commit to. So this is their, uh, uh, you know, their opportunity to uh, uh, go one up or one better on their uh, on their competition. Uh, as far as uh, what we have shown, uh, predicted coverage. Uh, so we, we have done an analysis uh, based on the uh, sites and the antenna heights, et cetera. Uh, so I've got three uh, pictures here. Uh, one is for the city area, and this is shown at the uh, most robust coverage level. This is the uh, uh, what we call the urban coverage level here, or uh, equates to a medium inbuilding for VHF. Uh, so this is the most challenging type of coverage. Uh, if, if we went, for example, portable on street, then you would see pretty much this whole area uh, greened out. But this is uh, specifically for the in-building. And you can see it covers essentially the entire portion of the city of Barrie. It uh, covers the corridor between the, the city, uh, Barrie City and Montpelier. And then it covers the vast majority of the city of Montpelier as well uh, with, the, with the sites that uh, we will be uh, using for the system. <clears throat> so uh, similarly, we took a look at the coverage uh, across the, the towns and uh, uh, we, we, can, we can overlay each of the different towns and the specific uh, uh, coverage or a, a service area in here, but this, shows the pretty much uh, close to ubiquitous coverage throughout the service area for uh, Capital Fire uh, here throughout all the, all the towns. This is shown at mobile coverage. Uh, there is substantial, of course, portable and in-building coverage here as well throughout this entire area using these nine sites. And finally, uh, one other item that uh, uh, was recommended in the study and we are including in the RFP is for the vendor to include additional receivers uh, for the uh, what's called the VMED channel or the medical channel that's used for ambulance to hospital communications. Right now, uh, the only receiver for that exists at the, uh, the medical center, uh, you know, which, uh, which is he. he here in this area here. Uh, so they have very limited coverage. And uh, one of the items certainly that we found during our needs assessment was they had uh, great difficulty hearing uh, the ambulance as they're uh, transporting patients to the hospital. Uh, so we found that with the addition of uh, just three additional receivers at uh, specific sites, Woodbury, Waterbury, and a uh, new site uh, we're calling Norwich University, uh, they can greatly improve uh, that ambulance to hospital coverage uh, within the service area. So uh, if I could uh, add to that, Tom, please. Yes, go so ahead. For those of you who are, are not familiar with radio communications, um, I'll just give you a, a quick education here. The transmit power from the base station relative to the transmit power of the mobile or portable is very different. And, and so what we do, in, and particularly in VHF and UHF, what we do is, is we use receive, remote receive locations to uh, allow the lower power from the portable and, and mobile radio to be received. Um, so, you know, you've got a high powered, uh, hot, typically a tall antenna transmit. So we, we call that the, the uh, talk, um, talk out path. 
Right. Um, and in order to ensure that the receive that it can receive the signals coming back from the mobile and portable, um, which is the talk back path, we incorporate remote receive locations um, in order to facilitate uh, the you know rece reception for you know both the portable um, and, and mobile radio back to the base station, and so. This is a, a, a much less expensive than building a full-blown site. Um, here you have a receiver and you've got a, a comparator uh, and you've got to have a, a backhaul connection so that you know you can get the signal back to the to the controller. But this is a this is a very effective and efficient and cost-effective way to uh, ensure that the signal is being received and can be heard on both ends. Uh, I'll be happy to explain it more if I didn't, if that wasn't clear, but that's the reason why you, you take this approach. Exactly. Great. Thanks, Rick. Pleasure. Uh, I mentioned one of the most uh, challenging parts is the uh, connectivity between the sites. And uh, we looked at that for the uh, two different uh, proposed simulcast cells. Uh, this is a concept for the uh, city uh, cell, which uses uh, proposed to use three sites, three antenna transmit receive sites, uh, the uh, Barry Auditorium, uh, the Medical Center, and then the uh, National Life Building here, these three. Uh, but obviously, uh, we also need to have the dispatch facilities connected to these uh, sites uh, so that uh, they can uh, uh, communicate. And uh, this is what we're proposing here. So there would be a total of, I believe this is five links, uh, one from the medical center to the auditorium, auditorium to Barry Dispatch, from Barry Dispatch to Montpelier Dispatch. Uh, that connection of course already exists today. And then we're recommending from Montpelier Dispatch to National Life, and then from National Life back to the medical center. So this is designed purposely in a uh, loop configuration uh, so that there's uh, connections to each of these. And uh, th this adds redundancy when you have a loop uh, design. So for example, if the uh, circuit between National Life and uh, the medical center were to, uh, were to go out, uh, you couldn't go, uh, you know, one direction around the loop, but you could go the other direction and you could still contact and communicate with all of the sites uh, in this loop here. So that's what's recommended. We're recommending this be done with uh, a circuit, uh, uh, generally referred to as an ELAN or an Ethernet LAN. Uh, again, some of these connections are already in place. Some would be added. Uh, we do have costs uh, for these uh, uh, that uh, Joe has worked on getting through uh, consolidated to provide uh, this connectivity. And, and again, just to follow up, the, 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 you know, the, this is a very robust design. Um, what will happen is, is that the circuitry will route in an opposite direction on the loop in the event that any one, any one uh, connection is lost. And, and this, this gives you five nines or higher reliability. Um, and, and this is really fundamental. You don't really have this today. You have, you have a single connection, which is great. Um, and you need that, but this approach um, gives you the redundancy that is desired. So this is a, th this approach, this design is, is, uh, is, gr is a greatly, a, 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 a tremendous improvement upon what is currently there. Exactly. And uh, you'll see that uh, uh, the town system, as we're going to, is a bit more challenging uh, because of the terrain. <clears throat> and we've evaluated this. So here we're showing uh, the nine sites. You'll see the push pins here are the nine sites uh, for the uh, proposed town system. There's an additional site here, or a push pin here for Barry um, Auditorium, uh, which is. Uh, in the city system, uh, we want connectivity to that uh, because uh, that's our uh, means of getting back to the dispatch facilities, uh, as well as uh, there is up here with Montpelier dispatch. Uh, but here, uh, to, to be the most cost effective, 
Uh, our approach here is to use a variety of different uh, connection options. So we evaluated what we refer to as the paths between these sites. So for example, uh, there could be a path from Norwich University to Beacon Hill. We evaluated that, we looked at the terrain using a, a terrain database and found out uh, that there are uh, at least uh, one, probably several uh, large uh, hills or mountain peaks in between those two, uh, those two uh, points. So uh, since microwave requires uh, line of sight connectivity, uh, a path between those two was not feasible. Uh, on the other hand, we looked at the path between Mount Pleasant and Beacon Hill. Uh, we can see that that is a, uh, a clear view, so we can get line of sight. Uh, so we would be, uh, this red link is uh, anticipated to be a new microwave link as part of the new system. So we're asking the vendor to propose this microwave link, uh, which would, uh, they would need to do the design they would mount a microwave antenna on Mount Pleasant and Beacon Hill and do that connectivity. Uh, we also see microwave links between Mount Pleasant, Mount Irish, and also to the Barry Auditorium. <clears throat> We're also proposing that the vendor uh, uh, give us some, uh, these are potential links. Uh, we've, we've seen these that look right now to be somewhat marginal. We'll want the vendor to evaluate them. Uh, so they will be instructed to evaluate if they can do a, a microwave link from Woodbury to Walden and also from Lincoln Peak to Waitsfield. If they can't, uh, then uh, there'll be a, uh, we'll look at a, uh, an E-line circuit uh, between those connections. Uh, the other major um, uh, cost uh, uh, cutting uh, uh, move here and partnership move is where we've been talking with, uh, with Velco uh, who has a network in this area and has uh, substantial microwave uh, connections currently, uh, they uh, appear uh, amenable to uh, allowing the Twin Cities to utilize their microwave network. Uh, so essentially uh, utilize a portion of that, uh, a, a, a slot, if you will, uh, to, uh, to carry the required traffic for this system uh, uh, between uh, a couple of points. Uh, so they currently have a microwave link between Lincoln Peak and Mount Irish and also from Mount Irish to Woodbury. Uh, so those are connections that we need. Uh, so they would, uh, uh, um, you know, we're still working on the terms for that, but uh, they appear uh, agreeable to offer that connectivity. Uh, that, of course, would not require the vendor to do anything other than connect to that. Uh, it would not need to add any additional uh, microwave antennas since they're already there uh, so that would be uh, a great uh, uh, you know a great uh, opportunity to take advantage of also they have connectivity from waterbury uh, or no i'm sorry they're what they call their duxbury site which is close to the waterbury tower that we plan to use so we would connect into the velco network there uh, which would be a short microwave hop and then we could connect into their network again and utilize that. Um, where we uh, right now anticipate using an ELAN circuit is from the Norwich University to Montpelier Dispatch. Uh, we, have, we have looked at all potential microwave links to Norwich University, uh, have not found an effective one <laughs> right now. Uh, so that's why we would be using an ELAN circuit there. So that, may be, that may be a bit... I'm sorry, I uh, just want to yes, finish one more thing, Rick. Uh, but that may be a bit technical, a bit complex, but uh, uh, this, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, look at the most uh, uh, advantageous and efficient means of connecting uh, these sites here in, in, uh, for this system to make this feasible. Go ahead, Rick, sorry. Okay, um, so uh, Dom, uh, I know you and Joe, I sat in a meeting or two and, um, for with Velco, and and you know you you indicated that they were likely to do it, but they were very very positive about oh, yes. about providing us access to to piggyback onto their microwave network. And of course, that's going to save us hundreds of thousands of dollars because these links, right. you know, that's what they wind up costing. So 
you know, we're really in a great position here, but I, I, have, a, I, I have a question for you. Who would they enter into the agreement with um, in order to um, in order to provide this access? Would that would be with the um, uh, which which group will have to sign the agreement? Because we'll have to have an agreement. And so I'm yeah. just curious, who whom do we have lined up that would um, you know that would sign? Uh, I guess I'm not going to answer, answer that. I don't know if uh, Joe or Nana have uh, uh, an opinion on that. I would think one of the entities potentially. Uh, one of the cities. Yeah, one of the cities. That's what what I would think. Yeah. And that discussion is part we need to have with the capital region group. Yes, but I, but that's why I actually brought that up so that you would catch on Thank to you. that because you know we've taken it you know as far as we could from a technical perspective. So technically it'll work. Um, we've included it into the, into the design. Um, we, would, we would remove the cost uh, of, the, of the equipment. Um, I mean, there's obviously the connection fees, but, but we removed it from the budget. But in order for us to solidify this, someone's gonna have to sign off on it. And I think just wanna put that, that, that important administrative uh, mm -hmm. activity has to be done. Sure. Uh, one other point, uh, you will notice that uh, the, uh, the previous slide, side had, uh, slide had a, a nice uh, loop connectivity. Uh, this one lacks that due to the uh, uh, difficult terrain and the uh, uh, lack of line of sight in many of these areas. Uh, but we will recommend and we will ask the vendor to quote uh, as options. We will recommend some additional links potentially as ELAN circuits uh, to help uh, uh, create some uh, at least uh, uh, partial loops within this network for redundancy. For example, a connection from Waitsfield to, uh, uh, to Duxbury uh, would be uh, one potential connection that would give us a little loop here. Or from uh, Walden uh, back to uh, uh, Barry Auditorium would also give us a loop here that would give us some redundancy. So uh, we are looking into that as well. Uh, we, uh, assuming we have budget for it, we could also do hot standby. I mean, you're key, there's two yes. ways that you're gonna lose a microwave. One, you could have a, I mean, you could have a fade, the, the signal could fade um, due to temp, you know, due to weather. Um, and that, you know, these hops aren't that long, so that may not be a problem, but you could lose, a, you know, you could use uh, the, the transmitter. Um, so in a hot standby, you would always have a backup um, in the event that you lost one module. So that, that's another way that you can, you can back, you know, you can ensure the higher probability of service here. You'd always prefer to have a ring or a loop as Dom indicated. You know that's ideal. That's that's public safety grade. But in this situation here, in order to get that, you'd have to have a num a number of sites that would you know would would be that would be relay sites, and and that that's a typically way you do it to get a ring here. But that that becomes very expensive. Right. It adds additional uh, infrastructure that has to be maintained and and very expensive. Donna. Don, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, and maybe it's for Joe. Um, with Velco being involved in this, they would be a non-government organization that's involved in a government organization. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. With, with that in mind, you know, in, in the hospital and the ambulance service, do we have some HIPAA issues with the transmission of that kind of confidential information on a public network? I don't believe any of the uh, VMED sites are utilizing uh, Velco microwave. So I don't think that's an issue. It's a standalone receiver. The VMED? Yes. All right. VMED is, yes, that's correct. So even, though, 
even though they're carrying our traffic, that doesn't mean right. they can hear our traffic. Right, right. And and it, okay. would, not, it right. would not it would not be accessible unless they had a a uh, some form of uh, uh, console uh, connectivity with that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with our specific frequency, and that's not intended, certainly. Yep. But Doug, you raise a good point. But that's they they we don't give them the uh, the ability to listen to our traffic. Right. I know. And, but you know, Val go ahead. Valco, Valco never they never are interested in that portion. This public private uh, cooperation follows what the state uh, has has set forward. Uh, before we started this project, so they they would just lend us or put into an agreement uh, allowing us access to the microwave bandwidth, and we did ask about uh, fogging and and stuff like that, and we're still waiting. They're they're analyzing it now, so yeah, we do want to understand what their reliability, uh, what the reliability of these links are to make sure that they're sufficient for a public safety system. No, so, I think they're and, they're, and, going be, they're going to be congratulated and, and appreciated for stepping forward and and offering that ability to do that. So it's a yeah, good thing. They've been very cooperative and very helpful so far. I'm very very pleased with their support. All right, thanks thanks for answering that, uh, Chief Brent. Do I see uh, you, you've joined? Do you have a question? Welcome. Uh, can you hear me now, Dom? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Welcome. Yeah. The only thing I was going to just uh, say for Doug's benefit was that, remember, all the VMED stuff can be picked up on a Radio Shack scanner anyways. <laughs> I kind of thought so, but. Yeah. Yeah, so not, even, even if it is a violation of HIPAA on some level, everybody in the world can listen to it. Okay. All right. Uh, I mentioned uh, site. Uh, uh, there'll be some site facility work uh, required uh, to make sure these sites are prepared for uh, the equipment that we plan to install. So, we'll, uh, uh, of course, we'll need uh, uh, lease agreements, uh, uh, MOUs or lease agreements uh, for each of the sites. Uh, uh, certainly, the sites uh, not owned by uh, either the cities or Capital Fire. Uh, so those, uh, we recommend that the Twin Cities uh, continue to pursue those lease agreements. Uh, so that, of course, uh, gives you permission to mount equipment uh, on the tower, uh, have equipment either in a shelter uh, or in a building uh, at that location and to operate that equipment. We also recommend Twin Cities uh, handle tower analyses and upgrades where necessary. So where there are towers, uh, there will be additional, uh, potentially additional antennas, additional equipment added to the tower, uh, which means we need to make sure the tower is structurally sound and can handle that equipment. So an analysis has to be done uh, beforehand before the construction uh, is attempted. Uh, we recommend uh, the Twin Cities uh, team pursue that as well, as opposed to making that a, uh, a vendor task. Uh, also, uh, the shelters, uh, we've identified that we will not need to purchase any shelters for the system. There are existing shelters or buildings uh, where the equipment can be housed. Uh, but again, that needs to be part of the lease agreement. And we also need to be able to uh, make sure we can describe the, uh, uh, the amount of space required for the equipment to be installed, the power, and the uh, uh, HVAC, the, the heating AC uh, capability necessary uh, to, uh, to operate that equipment. So we'll be asking the vendor to specify their power requirements, of course, uh, space requirements and HVAC requirements as well. So that'll be incorporated into the lease agreements. May, may I add a comment? On... Yeah, please do. So on, on the tower loading analysis, uh, this is a very important aspect because we're, you know, we're going to add a new antenna, a new transmission line, we're going to remove the old. So there's going to be, you know, add new, take down the old um, where, 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 where appropriate. 
um, and were necessary. Now, on a tower loading analysis for a tower that, that we don't own, and, and most of these we don't, but they're, they're typically there's the, the owner of the tower already has retained uh, a vendor that does loading analysis for them because the, you, the, the, the ideal way of doing it, and I'm hoping that uh, all the owners uh, are, are disciplined about this, but the way you do it is, is that you map your tower, you do a loading analysis, and anytime you modify that, add to it or take away from what's on that tower, you, you, know, you run the study again. And so the study should be already loaded. They should be easy to do um, if they've already been run. And they should be, anyone who runs a tower, it's just like, it's just like running a you know, multi-housing uh, unit. You know, you, you've got tenants coming in and coming out, you clean them and you keep them, keep them fresh and you change this, that and the other. The tower is the same way. So, you know, the, 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 what, if we ask the vendor to do it, they're just going to wind up interacting with the, the tower owner. So uh, how we do this is just work directly with the tower owners and, and they'll have vendors that they already rely on. And that, that'll reduce costs and that'll uh, make the tower owner happy. Okay, and uh, finally, I have one uh, uh, slide uh, left on uh, next steps. So the- uh, Excuse me, uh, Dom, uh, I see Doug Brent's hand up. Is that just from previously, or do you have a question, Doug? Thanks. Nope, that was from previously. I'm sorry, Donna. No, that's okay. It's yeah, just hard no to keep problem. track of on screen. Okay. okay. I thought Go it was ahead. giving me the high five here. Uh, high five. Yeah. Uh, so next steps. Uh, so the RFP uh, that uh, we have developed has uh, multiple components to it. Uh, so the primary uh, document is, uh, which is very detailed in terms of equipment specifications and requirements for the vendor to uh, respond to, uh, is the requirement spec. And uh, that's, uh, you know, substantial uh, document that uh, many of you uh, have, have seen uh, or had the chance to review. Uh, so that is uh, that is in uh, uh, substantially complete, I guess I'll call it draft form. I've gotten quite a bit of uh, uh, comments and uh, uh, enhancement suggestions, uh, which have been incorporated. Appreciate all those. So I think that is in very good shape. Uh, we have created a confidential addendum uh, to uh, uh, keep it uh, uh, you know, uh, keep limited access to the specifics uh, in terms of the, the sites to be used and the, the specific information about those sites. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the types of uh, facilities they are, building tower, uh, where the equipment will be housed. Uh, we're we're uh, keeping that in a confidential addendum to uh, limit access. Uh, so the interested vendors would need to sign an NDA and then have access to that. And they will need that, of course, to pro provide their response. Uh, we have developed a compliance matrix, uh, which has a, uh, a section for each paragraph in the requirement spec. The spec is developed such that uh, each uh, requirement is a spe specific line item or paragraph, and the compliance matrix refers to each of those. The vendor will need to go through every one of those line items, several hundred, and uh, identify if they comply or uh, have some alternate suggestion. So we, uh, that makes uh, our review of their response uh, uh, you know, easy and accurate. And then finally, there's a course cost submission spreadsheet, which we will be providing as well so that the vendors will have common uh, uh, capabilities or, or a, a common template uh, to provide their costs. And that'll indicate uh, the baseline system. There'll be uh, uh, several options that will be priced separately so that we can uh, decide which uh, options, uh, if, if any, to include based on their costs. Uh, so that uh, all these, these four items are all part of the uh, RFP that we've developed and are all currently in, in draft form uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, ready for uh, uh, for development uh, for and the uh, the final RFP. So all we we need to uh, 
address any uh, additional comments. Uh, Joe, you had a couple to me this week. Uh, I, I haven't given you the uh, uh, the updates to that, but that those have been incorporated. I'll be uh, giving you a copy of that uh, tomorrow. Uh, so, so those have been addressed. Um, so uh, we just need uh, to determine what the time frame uh, should be to uh, release this to the vendor community. So that's uh, that's all we we have uh, uh, right now. Uh, Donna, happy to answer any additional questions or uh, uh, entertain further discussion as to uh, next steps and moving forward. And I just say, excellent job, you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all your help. Uh, very, it's been uh, uh, invaluable. So uh, obviously working with you folks has uh, been a, is a pleasure as always, but I, I also want to point out that, you know, that, that there has been, a, you know, in the past, there has been discussions from some folks and they're, uh, they're, they haven't joined us yet, so maybe they won't join us, but the, you have a full design right now. I mean, basically what we've, what we've done is, is that we have I quantified the sites they we've get validated that they will provide us the coverage we need. They have been visited. Um, we have documented what's there, what's not there. Um, we we know there is sufficient space. Um, we what we don't know is tower loading, and and that's not our forte. We understand how that's done, and 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 we've explained that too. But everything else is is, is ready to go. Uh, all we need now is the funding. So, um, you know, we've got an RFP that's ready to get released. Obviously, it needs to be um, cus customized for the jurisdiction that will release it and when the, the time comes. But you, you have a, you know, a, 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 we're, we're an agreed, you know, the stakeholders that have supported this and, and, and Joe and, and Doug and, and others have worked very hard on this. Uh, um, and, you know, so we've got a package ready for you to begin circulating around. Dom, um, how much how much more effort is it to, put, to turn this into, you know, the, a, a final product? We can release it within, within days, I would think, huh? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, minimal, minimal effort remaining. Yeah. I mean, we, we've edited a number of times uh, internally, externally, had a number of sessions and, and, and received great input from the stakeholders. So you you will have a, you know a an a, a RFQ ready to go. Um, now it has to be as I as I was going to say or beginning to say uh, the jurisdiction that releases it, which maybe Montpelier, maybe not, but the their procurement department obviously will have some specific requirements for it. Um, but right now I don't think. I don't think we're ready for that because we don't have any funding. What we do have is a ready-made, you know, package ready to go that that positions you uh, for funding discussions with, you know, who met, you know, whatever agency um, is uh, has got some funds for us. I would. Uh... I'd like to interject for a moment here for everybody that's still with us. Uh, Donna has run into a problem with Zoom, uh, and because she has, you know, she's like left the meeting and tried to come back in, but Zoom won't let her. And, <laughs> and it appears, oh no, <laughs> it appears that we all may have to leave and then we all may have to go back in, but. She's texting to me, and I'll let you know. Okay. okay. I just I want to give you a heads up. Sure. In case something happens crazy with Zoom, and we're all gone. I don't know. <laughs> this used to be simple. Oh, good. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, Ken. Go ahead, please. Um, have you reviewed the grant application filed by the city of Montpelier with the Department of Public Safety 
to see whether that application is consistent with your recommendations. Uh, uh, Joe may need to help help me out here. I know we have had uh, discussions uh, regarding that. I don't know if we've uh, reviewed the latest uh, uh, version or not. So I, I will tell you that the application period for state funding has not been released yet. And neither Barry or Montpelier has tended an uh, application for those funds request. So I know we have discussed and, and provided some uh, uh, material to uh, that could be used in, in support of that. Well, I thought that there was a three and a half million request to DPS. No, no, no official request or application has been tendered by either cities or Capital Fire Mutual Aid. The the uh, application period has not been opened up yet, so. It was only as a placeholder, Kim. It was only, only as a placeholder and they asked what a rough idea would be, what it would cost. Right. They, they also asked other, other areas of the state what their projected costs would be. So we're not the only one they asked. They asked Chittenden County, they asked Essex, they asked Rutland County. They were asking multiple people on what, what numbers they would need. Sure, I, I understand there's a lot of people competing for us. What turn, will turn out to be a small amount of money, like $6 million. Um, and I just wonder how we get from here to there. there I don't think the number I heard, three and a half million, would mean that Montpelier would get half the allocation for the whole state. And that seems, that seems, seems like a problem. So Donna, if I might. Uh, yes, I, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you now. And um, I was just going to add a little to what Joe just said. Um, that um, application period has not opened up yet. And, and Kim is right. We're all kind of uh, trying to figure out what that allocation is going to be by the state. But the other thing is, too, there were a lot of parties that the state was talking to. However, there were only a few parties that were felt to be in a position to be shovel ready and were one of those. So we're, it's not like we're competing against, I don't believe 10 or 12 different parties for this money that they've initially allocated. That number is a lot smaller based on the committee's recommendation of who was shovel ready and who was not. We're shovel ready because of all the work that CVPSA and money that CVPSA has spent and the hard work that Dom and Rick have done to get us to this position that we are shovel ready. I have one follow-up question uh, for Rick and Dom. Yes, sir. Assuming there's money available, how many providers, can you name providers that might possibly bid on this project? Yes, uh, cer certainly uh, there will be, you know, we, we normally expect uh, Motorola and L3 Harris. Uh, Tate is another uh, uh, provider that we would expect to respond as well. Uh, and uh, uh, Kenwood E.F. Johnson would be uh, a fourth that we would expect. Well, it'd be nice to have some competition if that were true. <laughs> We, yeah, there's another action. vendor, Codan. Uh, Codan um, actually is uh, the president of Codan is a, is a longtime yeah. friend of mine. They are a New Zealand company and they have a U.S. base and they have a very pretty robust and, and, and less expensive 
uh, option than the major manufacturers that for a simulcast network. Uh, one of the things we need to be sure of is, is that whomever we do business with, that they have a local presence, you know, because yes. you you need to be sure that you've got someone within, you know, a couple of stones throw away that can be available to provide maintenance on the network. So um, uh, that, you know, I, I think while that's not, we, we haven't indicated that yet into the proposal in the end, what you're going to do is you're going to ask that that, you know, for them to validate how they're going to maintain it and it'll be in there because you, you, you really, you could do business with a company that provides you a very cost effective um, um, a network design that you're happy with, but you might they you might not give them good scores on their ability to maintain it because they don't have a local presence. So let me uh, refine my question: Then, how many people are there with effective local presence? How many probably three provide? to four. Three to four uh, vendors. Okay, I, I'm going to steer the conversation away from vendors specific uh, or even general. I um, can. I'm really sorry. Oh, well, it's totally sorry. frozen on my computer. So I'm, uh, but oh, there I you would are. like us to, to talk about the RFP itself. If it does what we intended it to do, everything that we've heard from Joe and Doug Brandt and Doug Hoyt uh, says yes. So do we need to approve this draft and then put it aside until we actually hear what money we get and then go back and work and reduce it to match the funding available is that the next step yes <laughs> <laughs> i think we have to well, identify a funding source for sure yes oh yeah we have one funding source we just don't know the amount okay so I would entertain a motion to accept this RFP draft until further editing due to funding changes. I'll second, I'll, I'll make that motion uh, with a clear understanding that it is a draft. And if there needs to be additional work done uh, within the next week, two weeks, three weeks, two months, whatever, that that can be done. I would assume that. Uh, okay, uh, Rick and Dom, how how long out are you available to do further editing? I mean, we. I'll, uh, I'll let Rick answer that. <laughs> and and you know, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it. Uh, it's not. I know the editing is not endless, and so if there's a charge, just give me the real picture. Well, I, you know, I think we could bring it to closure um, as is now, and and then I, my opinion is, you know, we bring it to closure. You now have it available. Um, you use it as part of your outreach um, with your whomever you're you're going to communicate with about it, and and when it's ready for releasing, you know, then you know when we when we so you can't release it until you secure some funding. So right. Yeah, once, know that. Once we release yeah, it, totally. you know, then then we have to go back and work with whomever the 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 procurement department is who's releasing it, and that yes. that that's a future task. Okay. It sure. doesn't take much. Though. Donna, with all of that in mind, uh, I, I guess I'd like to modify my motion. Go right ahead. To uh, go ahead and accept the report as a draft report and wait until we find some money. I mean, we can do anything we want with it in the future, but it's just a matter of accepting it where it is now. Yep. I'll second that. Okay. Okay. Justin, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember a second to the first motion. So is it okay if we just do a motion here in a second? There wasn't, okay. there wasn't a second. I didn't think so, but I'm not hearing everything, so. Good. No. Doug is correct. Perfect. There was no second to the first, so we're just going to do this. Yeah. Okay. So I'm really good, not good. modifying my motion. I've just got a new motion. All right. Any further discussion? Right. 
Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Wave. aye. Any opposition? Uh, Mel, I can't hear or see you. You may be having the same troubles I Oh, I'm sorry. I was on mute. Yeah, I'm an I. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, that was unanimous. Uh, and likewise, then we should, I would entertain a motion to approve final payment. We finished RFP, which is the 14,807 due. I move approval. Okay, any further discussion? Seems to me there may be. All in favor say aye. Well, Oops, I'm sorry, Kim, you wanna say something? Seems to me there's gonna be further work required, hopefully in the not too distant future. Well, uh, that may be, um, but this particular work is well, have we gotten what we contracted for? That I don't know. Donna appears to be well, frozen. Well, we allow it in the contract. Right now, we don't know. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hear you. Okay. <laughs> they have completed the work within the contract. Within the contract, there is a provision to do an extension for more work. Right. But Donna, I don't know what shut it your is video right off. That may completed help. as directed within. Okay. Well, that may. Okay. And this so uh, may, may i chime in a second yes go so ahead we we have not delivered to you to the board we have delivered to members uh, uh, on this call and and some that may be members uh, of the board the final the final draft of the rfp so i mean we we it has been circulated it has been reviewed by those who have been working on it and, and they have they have given a thumbs up that it's ready. Um, your board has not seen it yet. Uh, is this that, is the board tonight. They're seeing it tonight. We, I yes, sent it so out with the agenda. Did. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay good. Yes, you did, I, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see that piece. Okay. That's good. Well, then then you have it. Very not good. only did I do that, but you two did a great job of hitting the major highlights because it's a very dense. A document for people who aren't, you know, knee deep in expertise. I mean, so that was also very appreciated. Well, you, we, you know, you gave us good guidance, and so Dom and I put together. A, it was supposed to be a twenty-minute presentation, a little longer, but it was a lot of good dialogue. No, yeah, it was good dialogue. Uh, J Justin has his hand up. Yes, I just wanted to know two things: who seconded? That motion to approve the um, the final funding. Kim did. No. Kim did. No, I didn't. No, she did. Kim, Kim seconded I, the last one. He he seconded the one about accepting the draft report, not about approving the funding. Okay, he ended up with a question when when we okay. were about to, well, to I, ask. I will I will second Doug's motion to Thank approve you. final payment, and then I need the exact number. It's fourteen thousand. Don, can you type it in the chat? Because you can you type it in the chat because you're going in and out. Just type it in the chat and I'll copy it from there. Okay. Thanks. Any further discussion on that? All in favor of the motion to make the payment, say aye. Wave your aye. hand. Aye. Any opposition? Great. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, I'll probably send it to you later. I'm just too many things that's right fine. now. That's fine. That's fine. My, my computer's not go. responding. Okay, great. Uh, we've already sort of gotten the update on, on the next 
So Rick and Dom, you're welcome to stay with us, but your time is precious. We're gonna go on with our agenda. Uh, and so the next one is the Capital Region Update. And I think Bleed, Joe, and Doug Brent did that when I oh, Thank you all, have a, have a good evening. With Zoom, thank uh, you my Mary. understanding is it's sort of in limbo. We'll be back. Waving goodbye. Yes, we'll be back next meeting. Don't please invite us. Okay, thank we'll you. Do. Take care, everyone. Now, Justin, is your hand up still, or it's another one? Okay. Uh, so there's so we're know we're in limbo there, and they're waiting to hear. Then next on our agenda is the open meeting law. Uh, we have. Uh, discussion about a Justin, maybe you and a frame part of the discussion is dealing with the open meeting law violation that we received, but it's also to clarify legal advice. Sure. Are, do, are we going to go into executive session first, or we want to say it out in the open and then go into executive session? Uh, uh, this is Kim. Did I miss something? Did we decide to pass number five? Wait, has not received ours. They know about the capital region, but they haven't yet moved on it. Does that answer uh, your question, sir? That. So, so that item is passed. I didn't. It was discussed while I was gone. With no questions, you can ask them. Well, I missed any discussion on item five, so I just, if it was had, I missed it. Perhaps somebody has the um, connections, and I do. Now, maybe Doug Brent wants to report, or Joe, you want to say again what you sort of said before? So we are currently waiting for talk? the commissioner to release the application, period, so that we could submit it. Um, we were told that it was going to be done very shortly, but we at this point in time, we have not received um, word that the application period is open. Okay, thank you. All right, so due to the technicalities here, I was, can you still hear, if you can't hear me, Doug, put your hand up if I stop being um, audibly understandable. We were going to go, the board was going to leave this session and go into an executive Zoom session. I sent the link out to all the board members. I would like to close this community session and then reopen it, let's say in 30 minutes. So that means I will lose the public and Orca and any and Doug Brent, Joe, they can come back. Does that sound a reasonable way to deal with it? I'm open to suggestions. I think it's a good idea, Donna, but the 30 minutes is way too long. We don't need 30 minutes to discuss this. 10. 15? Uh, 10, okay. 10, 15 at the most. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. That's great. <laughs> so may I, may I clarify? Yes, no. Um, so what you're saying is that we're all going to close out of this one for about 10 minutes and then re-enter this one as the executive session, the same link. No, no. I set a separate link for the executive session just to the board. I don't think I got that. Okay. I can... Uh... I can, I can forward it. That By my phone. Or you can adjust it. I can forward it. Okay, thank you. Great. Now you're on the list, but I'm going to re-forward it to you. Uh, I'm just doing what we do at council. At council, we always go out of the community, Zoom totally, we leave it. And then we go to our executive, leave it, and then go back and re-enter the Zoom link. 
Uh, Mel, it was sent to your, uh, I just sent it to your Barry City email okay. address. Okay, I'm, I'm looking for it, home. but I okay. assume it'll show up in a minute. Cool. Yeah, meanwhile, I'm just going to read all this language, Mel, that's needed for the, this is one of those motions that needs two motions. So the first one is an office your general public knowledge of the discussion of our legal counsel advice will clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing what that legal advice is. This is a motion justifying why we have to go into executive session. Would someone second it? I second it. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye or wave your hand. Aye. 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 Great. It passes unanimously. I, I move that we enter into executive session to discuss the legal advice under the provision of Title I, Section 313A1 of the Vermont statute. I need a second. Second. Okay. All right. Aye. All opposed. Aye. Take your hand. For the motion to go into question. Do you not want to go into executive session? Yes. Can you hear me? We can't hear you, Donna. We can't hear you. Yes, executive session. Okay. Yes. Anybody opposed going into executive session? Pass unanimously. We're now going to leave this meeting. We'll come back in. So it's 812. We'll try to be back at 822. I'll restart it. Everybody will have to re-enter. I do apologize. Yep. Okay. So go to the executive session. Thank you. Thank you.